The Communist Party's campaign against the peasants was not just about land. It was an attempt to destroy much of traditional Russian culture and religion. Many of the early documents reveal the party's determination to eliminate the influence of the church. The man-made religion of communism could tolerate no rivals. The belief in God had to be destroyed. It was a holy war, but a war against the idea of the holy and the sacred, against the demands of conscience and a morality beyond politics. January 19, 1918. Decree on freedom of conscience and of religious organizations. One, there is a separation of church and state. Two, the conduct of state or other public legal social establishments will not include any religious rituals or ceremonies. Three, religious vows and oaths are abolished. If necessary, only a solemn promise will be given. Four, no church or religious organization may have private property. They do not have the rights of legal persons. Five, all properties of churches and religious organizations in Russia are declared to be public property. Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars, Lenin. Lenin himself was quite personally and virulently anti-clerical as well as being an atheist. In March of 1922, he sent a letter via Molotov to other members of the Politburo. In it, he talks about combating religion in a village called Shui, where the Red Army had been disarmed by the peasants, outraged at them going into a church and removing property. To Comrade Molotov, for the members of the Politburo, please make no copies for any reason. In regard to the occurrence at Shua, it is necessary right now to make a firm decision about a general plan of action. Now and only now, when people are being eaten in famine-stricken areas and hundreds, if not thousands of corpses lie on the roads, we can and therefore must pursue the removal of church property with the most frenzied and ruthless energy and not hesitate to put down the least opposition. In order to secure for ourselves a fund of several hundred million gold rubles. Therefore, I come to the indisputable conclusion that we must precisely now smash the Black Hundred's clergy most decisively and ruthlessly and put down all resistance with such brutality that they will not forget it for several decades. The campaign for implementing this plan I envision in the following manner. Sintashua, one of the most energetic, clear headed, and capable members of the All Russian Central Executive Committee. Ensure he must arrest not less than several dozen representatives of the local clergy and the local petty bourgeoisie. Immediately upon completion of this task, he must return to Moscow and personally deliver a report to the full session of the Politburo. On the basis of this report, the Politburo will give a detailed directive to the judicial authorities that the trial of the insurrectionists for opposing aid to the starving should be carried out in utmost haste and should end with the shooting of a very large number of the most influential and dangerous of the Black Hundreds in Shua, and if possible, not only in this city, but even in Moscow and several other ecclesiastical centers. So Lenin says that now when there is starvation in Russia, using this as an excuse, we can expropriate church valuables, saying they are to be sold for famine relief. When what we're really doing is creating a big fund to promote communism abroad. We, the Bolsheviks, have to destroy this generation so that future generations will never forget this. It was after this letter of Lenin that mass persecution of the clergy began. So, after this, what do you expect me to think of Lenin? These two photographs are very vivid, very sad testimony to what the anti-religious campaigns did to Russia and the whole Soviet Union throughout the 70 years the Communist Party was in power. This is a church, it was the largest church in all of the Russian Empire, built in the 1830s to commemorate the victims of the Napoleonic invasion. It was a beautiful church a few miles down the river from the Kremlin in Moscow, um, and it was decorated by some of Russia's most eminent painters, including Vrubel and Vaznetsov. Four, when Stalin was rebuilding the city in order to put in the metro and um, erase traces of the imperial past, he had the church blown up. He decided to make this the site of the largest statue in the world to commemorate Lenin and the Third International. When the engineers went to build the foundations of the statue, they curiously found that the foundations kept sinking. And it turns out that, of course, this plot of land next to the river was over a tidal basin and was a unable to support the weight of the world's largest statue, although it had, for a hundred years, held the weight of 
possibly the world's largest church. Frustrated in his plan, shall we say, to build this statue, he decided to build the world's largest outdoor swimming pool. And to this day, it's a very large swimming pool in Moscow. In the wintertime, it has a microclimate um, over it, a fog. Um, and it's believed that many people have lost their lives swimming in this pool in the wintertime. The Muscovites uh, refer to this as a sign of the wrath of God. Marxist materialism was the official ideology of the revolution. Anti-religious demonstrations were at the heart of the party's ideological struggle against the traditional faith and individualism of the Russian peasant. It was a tenant of the Orthodox faith that their saints were physically incorruptible, so the remains and relics of saints were displayed and mocked as part of the ongoing campaign to re-educate the people. It was a war against the very concept of the sacred. Yet when religious restrictions were relaxed under Khrushchev and Gorbachev, visitors to the Soviet Union would be surprised to observe the deep spirituality and abiding faith of so many of the Russian people.